policy. Um, so he's right now he's a he's a fellow at the uh, Berkman Klein Center uh, for Internet and Society at Harvard University and a lecturer uh, in the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, he is uh, he's the author of uh, of uh, fourteen books. He's a New York Times uh, best-selling author, uh, and he has written hundreds of articles and, uh, and and academic papers. In addition to all of that, he has a uh, a, a newsletter uh, and a blog that is followed by a quarter million people. Many of the followers of uh, of this blog and the, the newsletter are here in the audience. Um, so, without Further ado, uh, let's welcome Bruce. Thank you, and good, good afternoon. So I'm actually I'm actually here for another reason. So I figured as long as I'm here in Bangalore, I would uh, come visit and give a talk. So thank you for being an audience and uh, coming by. I know it's like the end of the semester, kind of an awkward time, but this is this is when I'm here. Uh, so I do teach security. I teach internet security policy. I mean, I don't. Uh, I mean, that New York Times best-selling book was not a cryptography book. And a lot of what I'm doing these days is is policy. Is trying to uh, teach tech to people working on on laws and regulations in government, in in industry, thinking about policy. And that's really what I want to talk about here, talk about it in terms of the Internet of Things. So I'll start with some of where I think the world is going, what's going on, and then why I think it matters. So the way I want to sort of start is by, by saying that, with that we're building a world where everything is a computer. And I think that that's an important way to think of, of what we're doing. Right? I mean, this is not a telephone. Right? This is a small portable computer that happens to make phone calls. And very similarly, your refrigerator is a computer that keeps things cold. And your microwave oven is a computer that makes things hot. And an ATM machine is a computer with money inside. A car used to be an electromechanical device, then it had a couple of computers, and now it is basically a computer with four wheels on an engine. Or if you actually study automotive computing, it is a 100-plus computer distributed system with four wheels and an engine. And this is true you know, for everything large and small, from the smallest of things to uh, the power grid. It's more than the Internet. It's more than the Internet of Things. It is this world where everything is becoming a computer with different peripherals. And this means uh, two things for our world. It means that internet security becomes everything security, because everything is on the internet. And it means all the lessons that those of us working in internet security have learned in the previous decades become relevant to everything everywhere. So I want to start with six lessons about computer security that we have learned over the years. The first is that most software is poorly written and insecure. If you study software, you know this. Software tends to, commercial software tends to be really lousy. The basic reason is economic. We don't want to pay for good security. Now, poor software is full of bugs. Some of those bugs are also security vulnerabilities, which means the software we use has lots of vulnerabilities. You know this from the patches you get for your operating system, your phone. It's true for everything. The second lesson is that the internet was never designed with security in mind. Now that seems crazy when I say it today. When you think back to like the early 1980s, there were two things true about the internet. One, it wasn't used for anything important ever. And two, you had to be a member of a particular research institution to get access to it in the first place. And for those two reasons, the original designers made a conscious decision to ignore security when they built the internet. They decided to keep the, the protocols insecure and move security to the endpoints. 
If somebody wanted security, they would build it themselves. And we're still living with the effects of that decision. So insecurities in the domain name system, internet routing, packet security, email addresses, we're still cleaning up from those late 70s, early 80s decisions not to build security into the protocols. The third is that the extensibility of computerized systems means everything can be used against us. Now, extensibility is a really important property of computers. It's not often called out in this way. I think it's important to think about it. Uh, now, uh, what extensibility means is you can't constrain the functionality of a computerized system because it runs software. Right? When I was a kid, I had a old telephone, big black thing attached to the wall by a cord, great device. No matter how hard you tried, it couldn't be anything other than a telephone. That's all it ever was. This is a computer that makes phone calls. It can do whatever you want. I don't know if it was here. In the United States, the first slogan for the iPhone was, there's an app for that. Whatever you wanted the iPhone to do, you could download an app. You can increase its functionality. You can change what it could do in a way you can't with that old style telephone. Now, this means a couple of things. This means the system is continuously evolving. It's hard to secure something whose functionality changes all the time. And it also means that computers can be downloaded with malware. If I get a virus on this phone, it's just new functionality. It's not functionality I want or I paid for or even might even know about. And this is why we're living in a world where refrigerators can send spam where we can see ransomware against a car because they're computers and they're extensible. The fourth lesson is that the complexity of computerized system means attack is easier than defense. I can spend an hour on this, but basically the intuition is that the more complex a system is, the, more, the bigger the attack surface is. So the harder it is to secure it because it's more work. When you think about securing your home versus this university, much more complex system, more, you know, more windows, more doors, more people going in, going out, more things going on. The attacker also can concentrate his attack. The defender has to spread defense across the entire attack service. But basically, in computerized systems, attackers have the advantage, technically. This has been true for a long time probably uh, true for the foreseeable future. The fifth lesson is that the new vulnerabilities and the interconnections. And as we connect things to each other, vulnerabilities in one thing affect other things. I don't know if you remember the uh, Dying Botnet from 2016. Those vulnerabilities in digital video recorders and CCTV cameras, the basic default passwords. Someone used those to create a botnet drop a large domain name system, which crashed about 25 popular websites around the world. And lots of examples of this, of attackers attacking a broad system through a narrow opening. And that really is the interconnections of systems. Uh, there's, my favorite story was now last year, there was a Las Vegas casino had their payments network hacked. And the attackers got in through their internet connected fish tank. And that's just the connection of everything to each other. And vulnerabilities like this can be hard to fix because it's not often clear who's at fault. You could have two systems come together, create a vulnerability where each system is good independently. And the last lesson is that attackers always get better, easier, than faster. Some of this is that computers get faster. Right, the password that was secured 10 years ago, uh, it might not be secure today, not because we're better at guessing passwords, just faster at it. But we also get better at things. Last week I blogged about a, uh, a new factorization record. And if you look at the speed ups, I mean, yes, there were speed ups due to Moore's Law, but there were significant speed ups due to the algorithms getting better. Tweaks in the algorithms. Was, was, was a bigger speed up than just waiting for computers to get faster. 
And also attackers get smarter. You have these arms races, attack versus defense. You might see them in spam versus anti-spam, uh, now in deep fakes versus deep fake detection. Uh, ATM machines versus ATM machine fraud. And expertise flows downhill. By what today might be a top secret NSA program, tomorrow is someone's PhD thesis, the next day it's a hacker tool. And maybe that's six months. But we see that attacks that were the purview of governments become common criminal tools. Now, up to this, none of this is new. I mean, none of those six things are new, but I think things are changing. And this has been manageable up to now, and I worry about the future. And the reason is that, uh, that the nature of computers are changing. And I think about automation, autonomy, and physical agency. Right? It's not the computers themselves, it's the things the computers are connected to and what they're doing. So traditionally, in computer security, we're concerned about confidentiality. And in doubt, there's actually, you remember the CIA triad? The three th the properties we're supposed to provide is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. It's always been true, but by and large, computer security is concerned about confidentiality. Privacy, data theft, data misuse. When there is a story of a hack in the news, it is usually a confidentiality breach. But the threats come in many forms. We've been seeing more and more availability threats both DDoS attacks and ransomware, right? nothing stolen, but you can't, systems don't operate. There are also integrity threats. I mean, imagine a bank, certainly worried about manipulating bank balances in their database, right? No data is stolen, but money is stolen because of the integrity breach. Now, what's different is that today, the availability integrity vulnerabilities are much worse than the confidentiality vulnerabilities because the effects are greater, because there are real risks to life and property. So while I'm concerned if someone, I don't know, hacks a hospital and steals my private patient medical records, I'm much more concerned if they change my blood type. And that's a data integrity attack. And I don't want them to uh, hack my car, turn on the Bluetooth microphone, ease up on my conversations, but I really don't want them disabling the brakes. That is a data availability attack. That when you, you think of all the different things, cars, medical devices, drones, weapon systems, thermostats, power plants, smart city, anything. There's a real difference because of what the computer is attached to and what it can do. So we are concerned about ransomware against cars. DDoS attacks against hospitals. And there's a fundamental difference between your spreadsheet crashes and you lose your data and your embedded heart monitor crashes and you lose your life. And it could be the exact same CPU and operating system and application software and vulnerability and attack tool and attack. The difference is what the computer is attached to and what it can do. And these trends become more critical as our systems become more critical. So I have a seventh lesson, that computers fail differently. Normal things fail in some random stochastic manner. So think of cars, there are a lot of cars out there on the street. Those cars all fail once in a while. Cars have parts, parts have some mean time between failures, we can calculate how some mathematical model of how often cars will fail, and there will be an industry of auto repair shops in your city and my city everywhere to deal with that steady state of car repairs every day, every year, throughout the life cycle of automobiles. Computers don't fail that way. Computers all work perfectly until one day when none of them do. That's different. And it's a difference the world kind of isn't ready for. So I'm staying at the, uh, the Taj Hotel, and uh, like many hotels, the Taj has a keyless entry system. I have a card, when I go to my room, I wave it in front of the reader, door opens up. 
right? Some kind of wireless near field. I don't know if it's blue. I don't know. I don't even know what the protocol is. Uh, one of the companies that makes those systems is called Omni. I actually don't know if they make the Pataja system. It's kind of hard to tell from the outside of the lock. Uh, a couple of years ago, someone found a vulnerability in Omni locks. And that basically allowed someone to break into hotel rooms without the key. And the way you repair your lock, if you're a hotel, is you go to every hotel room door manually and flash the ROMs. Which basically means no one did it. Because the Taj Hotel, I know, has some protocol for dealing with broken locks. They have some locksmith on call, who if there's a problem, they'll call him up, he'll come, he'll fix the lock, he'll leave. They do not have a protocol for all 200 and something rooms in our hotel need to be upgraded now. They just can't deal with it. And that's true for a lot of things that are now computers. They don't know how to handle this way of operating. So at the same time these six, now seven trends are occurring, some of our long-standing security assumptions are failing. I'll talk about three of them pretty quickly. The first one is patching. And patching is how we get sick. Actually, there's two ways. The reason our computers and phones are as secure as they are, are one, the team of engineers, in this case Apple and Microsoft and Google, security engineers designed to be secure in the first place, and two, those same engineers are on call to write and distribute patches when they find the inevitable vulnerabilities. Right? We can't, we don't know how to write secure software, so instead we are agile, we upgrade quickly. And that works really well. I mean, that's how we get secure in these devices. That isn't the same for low-cost embedded systems like DVRs and home routers. Uh, they're built at a much lower profit margin. They're uh, often uh, third-party, private label. Security teams come together, write the code, then disperse. They just pe aren't people on staff to patch, to write patches for vulnerabilities when they incur in some of these low-cost systems. Even worse, a lot of them have no way to patch. Right now, the way you patch your home router is you throw it away and buy a new one. That's the patch mechanism. We don't have another one. Now, you know, throw it away and buy a new one is actually a pretty good patch mechanism. Right? Every time you buy a new phone, a new computer, it's more secure, better designed, software better written. But if you think about some of these systems, they're going to be around for decades. You buy a car today, software is two years old, it's going to be on the road in 40 years. If not in this country, in some other country. So think about that. Think about finding a computer from 1977. Try to boot it up. Try to make it secure. We haven't the faintest clue how to maintain 40-year-old consumer software. Both Microsoft and Apple will depreciate their operating systems after two or three revs because it is too hard to maintain the old stuff. I, I try to think, what is our manufacturer going to do? Are they going to have a test bed of 20 models times 40 model years to run every patch by? I don't know if that's possible. We've never done it before. Second thing that's starting to fail is authentication. Authentication kind of only just barely ever worked. I mean, you know all the problems with human memorizable passwords. Two-factor is great. If you can use it a lot of places, you can't. Back authentication is always terrible. But the amount of authentication we are going to do is going to explode exponentially. So right now, when you authenticate, it's either one of two ways. And I will demonstrate. You will uh, log on to your device. And now I just check my email. Right? So it's me authenticating to a, a, a thing, to an object, and me authenticating to a remote service. And those work, those were pretty quick. What is changing is the rise of thing-to-thing -thing authentication. Internet of Things, 5G is not there so you can watch Netflix faster. Right? 5G is there so things can talk to other things. 
and we're going to see an explosion of things talking to each other. And they're going to have to authenticate. We don't know how. When you think of some kind of, I don't know, driverless car model, or at least a, a uh, driver-assisted car. That car will have to authenticate to thousands of other cars, and traffic signals, and road signs, and emergency alerts. All ad hoc, all in real time. We don't know how to do that. Now, if you have a hundred IoT things on your person, that's 10,000 authentications. If you have a thousand things, that's a million authentications. We don't know how to do that. We can do a little bit of it. And right now, when I go to my car, my phone automatically authenticates and uses the microphone and speakers. That's Bluetooth. Works great. But if you remember Bluetooth, I was there to set it up manually. I had to pair the devices. And I'll do that 10 times. I'll do it 25 times. I'm not doing it 10,000 times. I'm not doing it a million times. And if you have an IoT anything, invariably, you can control it from an app. And this is the kind of de facto IoT controller hub, kind of by accident. And again, it'll work for 10 or 25 things, but not for 1,000. So we have some really big problems in scaling IoT authentication and control. The third thing that's failing is supply chain. Now, I don't know how much the news gets here. In the United States, the big debate about supply chain is Huawei, right? Should we trust Chinese-made networking equipment? Uh, two years ago, the debate in the United States was about Kaspersky. Should we trust Russian-made antivirus equipment? Sorry, it's Chinese-made networking equipment, Russian-made antivirus equipment. It's not just in the United States. Uh, I remember an article in 2017 where India banned uh, <coughs> about 40 Chinese smartphone apps. Uh, 2014, China banned Kaspersky, and also the U.S. company Symantec. Uh, in 97, I remember debate in the United States about, uh, about Checkpoint. Should we trust an Israeli security company? This is actually a really important question. Should you trust computer equipment designed, built by a company in a country whose government you don't trust? Right? That is a really important question. But it's just the tip of a much larger question, and a much more complicated question. Now, this is an iPhone, but it was not made in the United States. Its chips were not fabbed in the United States. Its programmers probably carry 100 different passports, more, any of which can subvert the security of this device. We found backdoors in Juniper firewalls and D-Link routers. We found attempted backdoors in the Linux distribution. And there's a lot more. You have to trust how the software is distributed. You know, we know there are fake apps in the Google Play Store. We see them all the time. You have to trust the update mechanism. Remember, NotPetya was a, a Russian uh, virus distributed through a malicious update to a Ukrainian accounting package. You have to trust the shipping mechanism. Do you remember the, uh, the Snowden photos of uh, NSA employees opening a Cisco box to add a backdoor to a router intended for the Syrian telephone company? So a paper a couple of years ago, you can hack this iPhone through a malicious replacement screen. So this is hard. We can't trust anyone, yet you must trust everyone. Right, supply chain, one week link breaks the whole security. Do you anyone remember the, uh, there was a, a story from last October about backdoors in networking equipment from China intended to serve for various cloud providers in the United States? Apple Cloud, uh, the, uh, the Amazon Cloud. Oh. Thank you. I get coffee. It's warm. So a really big story that, that was actually never proven one way or the other. And I mention it because it's a year later and it's still never been proven one way or the other. We actually don't know. My guess is it's not true, but I don't know. 
So this is a real hard problem. We have no good answers. And the United States could consider making a U.S. only iPhone. It would cost ten times as much as somebody would buy it. You know, maybe the, uh, I mean, the one country that is trying to build a completely domestic internet is China. They have the population to get, get away with it. You might. I don't think anybody else has a chance. U.S. can't. EU can't. Russia can't. Nobody else is big enough. This is a deeply, deeply international industry. And that makes supply chain very hard. So, I mean, I, I've been writing about this sort of as a perfect storm. Security is failing just as everything's becoming interconnected. And I really write about this as a policy problem. There's a reason I teach at a policy school, not at a tech school. Because I think right now, my big problems are regulating tech. Now, we have a lot of tech don't have a lot of regulations on using tech. And my latest book with the <coughs> great title of Click Here to Kill Everybody talks about this. And I want to talk about two, uh, two principles from that book. One uh, policy, one tech. Policy is that defense has to dominate. It's a big debate in the United States right now about offense versus defense. If you follow the news, it's all about back doors. Backdoors to communication systems, backdoors and devices. U.S. government wants backdoors. Security and security experts say, don't do that, that's crazy. I think we need to decide as a matter of policy in countries around the world that defense has to dominate. And when there's choice in offense and defense, we need to build for defense. And as these systems get more critical, that becomes much more important. Now, we had an article a couple of weeks ago about President Trump and uh, the Russians eavesdropping on his uh, phone calls. And that is a significant security risk. And we need to build systems to, to prevent that. The, uh, the tech principle I want to mention is that we need to start thinking about resilience. We need to build systems that assume in security and get security as emergent properties regardless. And we kind of know a bit about how to do resilience. Defense in depth, compartmentalization, avoiding single points of failure, ways to fail safe and fail securely, deleting data, removing functionality, <coughs> systems that monitor each other. I think we need a lot of research into resilience. Right? Can we build a resilient network? In some of the ways, that was the original uh, research question that brought the internet. But can we build a reliable network out of unreliable parts? I have a similar question. Can we build a secure network out of insecure parts? And we don't actually know. That is an open question. It seems unlikely, but I think we need to start really thinking about this. The real question to me is how to get from here to there. And I spent a lot of time thinking about U.S. policy and what we need to do to start regulating the internet. And, and the United States, at least, there's a very uh, strong ethos in Silicon Valley that government should stay off and not touch the computer industry. I think that's going to go away. As these computers start affecting the world in a direct physical manner, as they start killing people, government will get involved. So I think the choice is no longer uh, you know, government involvement versus no government involvement. It's smart government involvement versus stupid government involvement. Which is why I spent a lot of time thinking about <coughs> what smart government involvement might, might look like. Uh, international considerations are real interesting here. You mean software tends to be right once, still everywhere? Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Europe passed GDPR, Comprehensive Privacy Regulation uh, in Europe. <coughs> And a lot of companies implemented GDPR around the world. I used to work for IBM. IBM made a decision to implement GDPR worldwide because it was easier to do that than it was to figure out who a European was. Uh, California just passed an IoT security law. Okay. Not a great one. It's a start. One of the things it uh, mandates is no default passwords. Actually, so it's a good. Uh, that's a good thing. 
So you imagine a company somewhere in the world that makes internet-connected thermostats? They will change their code to not have a default password. They need to sell in California. And that updated code will be available worldwide. Right? You in Bangalore, me in uh, Massachusetts, will both benefit from a California law. Because that's how software works. And again, I don't see any alternative. You know, I think more government laws will be where we're headed. <clears throat> so I want to end with a call to, uh, for technologists to get involved in public policy. To get involved in public policy. So as internet security becomes everything security, internet security technology becomes more important to overall security policy. And, and all the security policy issues, really, of our decade will have strong technological components. And we will never get the policy right if policymakers get the tech wrong. So I talked about the going dark debate in the United States and other countries. We can think about the vulnerabilities and should governments hoard them or make them public. Uh, secure voting machines. Big debate in the United States right now. National ID cards, right? Big issue in, in India and other countries. Driverless car security. And a lot of these strong policy debates have required deep tech understanding to get right. Over the past year, we've, we've in the United States had a whole lot of hearings where social media companies were hauled up in front of Congress to answer questions. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg testified uh, before a Senate committee, and a senator, an actual elected official in my country, asked Mark Zuckerberg, how does Facebook make money? Now that's stupid on two levels. One, he didn't know, and two, he didn't realize that was a dumb question. And these are the people who are making tech policy in the United States. I'll bet anything India is not better. <laughs> and, but we want them to make good policy. And that is going to require us to get involved somehow. Whether it's working for government, whether it's advising government, whether it's doing public focused research, whether it's working on policy for a tech company. Right? If we don't start getting involved in policy, bad policy will happen to us. So that's my talk. Happy to take questions. All right, so I left a bunch of time for questions. Because I assumed you'd be a questioning bunch. So now your job is to prove me right. And that rule, what that will take is the first one. Because once someone does it, everyone else will. There we go. Thank you. So, uh, Bruce, let's talk about this law, policy decisions of technology. Uh, as we have seen, so, so there have been so many advances in hardware, especially focused towards security. What uh, that has done is actually increase the attack surface, increase the complexity, putting more software into the hardware than the hardware itself, and decrease the uh, way to pass on vulnerabilities in the hardware. So, well, what do you think, uh, uh, what's your opinion on that in the sense that, is that uh, a road that we should go on, or is that something very sort of dumb decision by so I don't think we have a choice. I think we are going down that road, and it's just because of economics. So what? By even like ten years ago, fifteen years ago, if you were going to design a refrigerator, you would build the electronics custom for the refrigerator, and you would you would design and make a chip or two that would run the refrigerator. You don't do that today. Today you pull some like Raspberry Pi off the shelf. And you write refrigerator software and you make your refrigerator. That means your refrigerator comes with an IP stack and video software and audio software and everything. And that's why we're seeing things like refrigerators on the internet. 
That's why a Roomba has a microphone. Because the code's already there. And it's a lot cheaper to, to design it that way. So I think we're moving to a world where sort of all where hardware is more software than hardware for economic reasons. And, and, we, and as security people, we can't stop that. We have to just accept it. But I, I think that's why we're seeing this explosion in sort of weird functionality. Because you're building this robot vacuum cleaner and you say, well, I don't know. It's got a camera port. Let's put a camera in it. Why not? That's why when you uh, see a, a video screen in the back of uh, your airplane seat, it has a camera. Because you can't buy a video screen without a camera anymore. They all come with cameras. So even if you don't turn it on, it's there. And it's a software, so someone could turn it on. So I don't like it from a security perspective, but I don't think I can fight it. Because the economics are so in favor of standardized, low-cost, do-everything hardware that you customize the software. See a hand there and a hand there. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Is there some argument, uh, policy argument to be made uh, about taking a step back in some sense, like just the rapid pace at which technology is evolving? Because I, I can see that it doesn't work because one person does it, it's uh, similar to the genome component of where like, someone does it and then it's there. Like, you cannot take a step back. Really. So I think, I think there is a policy argument. I don't think it'll win. So in the United States, uh, I remember this about drones. For many years, we were told it is too early to regulate drones. You can't do it to stifle the market. Then like one year, everyone got one for Christmas. And then suddenly, it was too late to regulate drones. They're everywhere. And, and that, I mean, that's what you're talking about. Things just move so quickly. And I mean, yeah, I think it would be smart to slow down. But I don't think we're capable of it as a species. We're just not going to do it. So we need a better way. Right, we need some way to have policy as agile as tech. I don't know what that way is, but I don't think we can. I don't think we can turn general tech into pharmaceuticals, right, where everything takes four years of, of, of testing before you can actually field it in the real world. I mean, that's just not going to work for tech. Now, everything isn't going to be an aircraft. This is going to be a new drug or a medical device. So I think we need to figure out how to be faster and more agile in policy making because we're not going to be able to slow down tech. So uh, on this, there's obviously a good and bad in Oh, yeah. Human, humans, uh, computers, and so on. So I think Trump today is a better thing to safeguard yourself rather than asking for the policy. Policy makers can safeguard you all right. So you can't do that actually. Okay? So you're sitting in this room, you look, you look pretty safe. You're not worried all the ceilings are gonna collapse on your head. And that was policy that did that. Right? And when you uh, go out to a restaurant, you're not gonna get food poisoning. And that's policy that's doing that. I'm gonna get an airplane. Tonight, oddly enough. And I'm not going to worry that's going to crash. And that's policy, again. Policy is how we get security. We live in a, you live in a, you're, the world we live in is too connected. You're too interdependent. You can't take care of yourself. You did that, you moved somewhere where no one was, and you, you know, you live all by yourself. Living in a world of society means that you need to trust lots of things. I'm getting in a taxi. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of crazy. But individuals also have to be careful. Right. And also on the internet, you know, I have to trust Apple. I can't not. Right? And your email is probably on someone else's computer, and so are your photos, and so is your documents. And if not, you're three sigma, and everybody else is, and that's the way the world works. I not only have to trust Google with my email, I can't even audit them. I ask them what their security is, and they say, we're not going to tell you. Then how do I know you're secure? Don't use us if you don't like it. 
And that's where that's where we're headed. We, we, you know, we we can't do a buyer beware. We don't have the ability, and except for this room, we don't have the expertise. So I show a hand way back there. I want to get that the mic to that person. Uh, you talked about uh, the users in one country needing to trust uh, software produced by people in another country, and these many countries in some kind of market or which do not completely trust each other. Do you have like do you hope that this can ever be achieved without making all of the software open source? I ask this because uh, not very few companies have been able to like, be profitable despite having all their software uh, open source. I don't even think you can do this if the software is open source. I mean, software that's open source, you don't compile it yourself. How do you know it's the same software? I mean, I could put a vulnerability in the compiler. Right? This was a famous paper. You know, so, right, right? I mean, you, it turtles all the way down. At least in theory, you can like bootstrap a new compiler from. I know, but at least in theory, it doesn't work because it's only in theory. In practice, I buy an iPhone, I put a bunch of apps on it, and I do stuff. And if, the, and if all those apps are open source, that can make a bit of difference. So I actually worry about, I mean, I think this is actually a very hard problem. I don't have an answer, I don't have an answer. But the easy answers don't work. Because in the end, you have to trust thousands and or tens of thousands. I mean, I mean, you could pull the paper where it talks about the screen hack. It was at a chips uh, conference. The, uh, I saw another hack that you, uh, Someone was able to add a mask into a, a, a chip that was being fabbed that hacked the chip that the designers would have no idea and wouldn't be able to test for. And there's some really subtle hacks that you have to trust. And this is hard. This is actually very hard. Let's see a hand there. Anything else? So if you if you if you're building a device to automate something, say a coffee maker, are there any uh, best practices you can follow to keep it secure? Are there any recommendations you have? No, there are, there are, and lots of people write sort of best practices. I mean, my, my problem is that the market doesn't reward them, so the companies don't do them. And it's someone who's building by you said a toaster, yeah. and, right? They just want to be as cheap as possible, as quick as possible. And, and they're not going to spend time on best practices. They do fast practices. So, and that's where kind of I need regulation. I mean, this building is more likely to collapse if it wasn't for building codes, because it'd be faster and cheaper. And building codes, you know, are, are what keep us safe. And the same thing with the airplane I'm going to fly. Right? So, so I you know the economics don't reward safety and security very much ever. I think that's a lesson of the past hundred years in a, in a dozen different industries. Would you say in that context, open source hardware might might fare better, or do you say it might make some difference? You know, I think it makes minimal difference. I tend to like open source, but it's definitely not a panacea. I mean, it's just one more bit of transparency. Transparency tends to be good, so it's one more piece of transparency. It's not going to solve the problems. Our hand there. Do you have a question already? Yeah. Hey, let's get another up there. Uh, you mentioned that uh, policymakers uh, often fail to understand um, or appreciate the need for security. And we, we find the challenge even with, uh, uh, with with people in the in the IT industry. Oh yeah. So, so does the responsibility for uh, influencing policy come back to the to the tech world? Uh, I mean, I don't know if the responsibility falls back to us, but we're the only ones who can do it. And this is where I'm stuck with that even if it's, if it's not our responsibility, it's nobody's, because no one else has the capability. I think we as technologists have an understanding of how these systems work that policymakers need to know. And if we don't, rise to this challenge. Lousy policy will be made because we're not in the room. And that will be worse. So I'm not saying we all need to do this, but some of us do. And um, it's not going to pay as well. 
It might not be as much fun, but we've got to do this. Is your hand back there that I saw? No. So one there. Hi, Bruce. Uh, one thing is like whenever there is a vulnerability which gets disclosed to the software vendors versus the time when they provide the patch, right? So the, the timing is like there is no policy or something. Do you think that should be a policy that says that, you know, this is the minimum window by which every vendor when they block or when nobody gets reported, they should fix and the patch should be available to them. Right. Yeah, so right, the question is really about specifics of, of, of regulations. I tend to like more general regulations than specifying times, technologies, specifics. And I think we get stuck. If we do, if we over specify in law, then we stifle uh, innovation. You know, if, if we just say it has to be done timely and let some government agency figure out what timely means, then timely can change. And we have experienced that, at least in the United States in the uh, Federal Trade Commission that regulates uh, a lot of uh, consumer safety and, and security. And their regulations tend to be more fluid. So you want to have an actual number of days. This is going to depend on the industry. It's going to depend on so many variables. And does it matter? I mean, I think it matters more for medical devices than toys. You know, I mean, I. I I think there's a whole lot of variables, so I can't figure out one specification for everybody. I also have to worry about uh, companies going out of business. <laughs> if you think about the Internet of Things, we're going to have all sorts of devices in our world where the company that built them just, just isn't in business anymore. And there'll be low-cost things or appliances. I mean, you know, Apple's not going anywhere. But is there was ever making you know the random interconnected toys might not be around in five years. And the toy might be around in twenty. Now your your second question again. So do you think uh, psychology of security can play a role? Yeah, I've, re I've written a bunch about the psychology of security. Uh, I think it's less uh, playing a role in the solution and more understanding to know what the where the solution space looks like. And I tend to look at the psychology and economic considerations as the landscape that we have to work with. That if I build solutions that aren't usable, it doesn't matter how good they are. If I build solutions that aren't economically viable, it doesn't matter how good they are. So I need to work with psychology, sociology, economics. Now, I think we need more social science in our uh, computer engineering. Coming back to consumer devices, because uh, uh, some organizations in the US and actually they regulate uh, consumer devices, right? But they have magnetic uh, sure. uh, radiations. Yep. So it's true that the security problem is very complex. So there's no question of simple things like measuring electromagnetic. So because of this, is there a solution by which you can say that uh, you have provisional, let's say, security because you check certain things? But you have complete details about how you engineer your product, something somewhere on the lab or whatever it is, right? Is there a way in which you can say that this particular thing has been tested in this possible way? So I, think, I, don't know, so I think we need to think along those lines. It's going to be hard. We certify medical equipment, right? we certify airplanes, we actually certify complicated things for safety and security. So we kind of manage some of it. I mean, we need something like that. Uh, Consumer Reports is a, a United States testing lab. They test consumer devices for all sorts of uh, energy efficiency and other reliability. They're starting to do security for IoT devices. What that looks like, I don't know. But, you know, they're trying to figure that out. But we, we, don't, we need more research in figuring this out. So this is a follow-up question. This, uh, because there's a similar thing in the uh, the administration of uh, large organization, ISO 9000. Sure, right. So there's a similar thing in the security space also. The question is, how seriously are they going to take Yeah, and I don't know the answer, right? And you're right. Uh, get my I don't know the answer. But, but right, some of those standards that certify processes more than the thing. 
So we're going to certify the process by which you design, the, you design all your devices. And that's used in, uh, in medicine also. Is that in the power industry part of it? Power industry, yeah. There's a whole bunch of, of uh, automobile. But we see that fail, right? I mean, this, the 737 uh, MAX is a real example of certification process that failed miserably. And then we can, you know, we can really unpack that and learn a lot about how not to do it in, in security. Please, you said that if you build one of the reason for systems being insecure, but in the design process, can we emit the connectivity? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I like that. Some limiting connectivity to certain protocols, certain, you know, right, much more narrower pipes. My guess is that'll be part of the solution, that this idea of connecting everything will uh, is temporary. But, you know, it's hard to do. Again, the reason is that it's all standard chip, standard software. But yeah, reducing connectivity feels like part of the answer. I like to rip out code that's not being used. I think that would be useful. Right? And, and, and that's sort of a, a, a subset of that idea. For example, the car system, not everything is connected. That's right. But you know, cars are cheap. They have one bus. They have one bus because it's cheaper than two buses. And that same bus runs the, uh, the brakes and the entertainment system. That's not my idea, but that's the CAN bus. So, you know, we could design it to be more secure and it'll be more expensive. And if we want manufacturers to do that, you have to make it a law. See a hand over there. You know, I think we are going to trade off between uh, functionality and security, convenience and security, price and security. And these are all trades we're making. Right now, security tends to be at the uh, short end. And that's where regulation comes in. Regulation raises the cost of insecurity. You'll be fine. You'll go to jail. You won't be able to sell your product. All the things government can do. All I want them to do is to raise the cost of doing it wrong so you're more likely to do it right. That's my goal. So, yes, I mean, these trade offs, I think, is we'll be making them. And we make them a little differently. And regulation is how society makes those trade offs. Okay, so get the microphone over there for the, this second question. I know. You were in my queue. Thank you. Uh we both shred paper, it seems, as a fidget habit. Um, yeah, I think my question was uh, about this. So you mentioned one of the important uh, critical things is privacy, that uh, it's uh, become a bigger, uh, more of a concern. And when I thought about this uh, a while ago, it was really because of the distributed nature of like, So data is being sold all the time. But my data is there in different organizations. Um, so Google has my data, Google Maps has my data, maybe some other organization has different piece of the data, my searches and so on. And, and the fact that these guys really don't share that data with each other kind of does give me some notion of privacy that, yes, like if you connect all of those pieces together, it could be much worse. Uh, so my question was, um, do you think uh, a non-collusion assumption, like when you kind of enforce that these parties should not share something between them, will that fly in the policy world? Because it's really hard to uh, like ensure that we didn't communicate this offline or just through side chats. So two things. One, there's more sharing than you know. So I'm, I hate to burst your, your bubble, but uh, and, and, and so EFF did a really nice report on this like two weeks ago. And it was like a deep dive into corporate surveillance as a title. And it talks about all the data sharing that happens at the corporate level about you. It's way more sharing than you realized. And yes, that's bad. And I think you're right that, that part of the solution is to limit the amount, the information that can be bought, sold, and traded. That, that keeping it in silos will increase our privacy. But that that will take work because right now it is a free fall out there. At least in the United States, I assume India is no better. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, there should be a policy approach to doing this. I system. definitely a policy approach. Okay. All right, you're my last question. Let's so actually do a threat to the airport and get a plane out. <laughs> So my question is, uh, you are talking about policy okay, uh, and having the government involved. 
But the thing is, what makes you think a government would be any better than a corporation? I mean, I, as much as I so, think, so a corporation, their job is to take your money. They don't have your best interests at heart. Do you think the government does? Government is more likely to because nominally we elect them. I mean, all these systems are flawed. I need different systems watching each other. I mean, I need government and corporations both in there working at cross purposes. That's how I'm going to get my best outcome. So no, government is not a panacea. It's not going to magically solve the problem. But it is how we deal with corporate excesses. Now we're living in a world with way too much corporate excesses. So government's my missing piece. So it's definitely not the answer. A lot of problems with Man, when I wrote stuff in my book, because I gave a lot of detail on how this can and can't work. And I don't want to minimize any of that. But but no government, government abdicating is, is bad. And this is the world the government abdicating gives us. It's not great. I think it's, I think we're only gonna get only will go up with government involvement. The thing is that what historically what happens is that as governments get involved in any business, the intervention just keeps on increasing and increasing and Right, and then you, and then people stop dying, and then maybe it's better. I don't know. I'm, 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 in, I, I'm in favor of a lot of regulation in drugs. I think it's good. I think government getting involved like more and more and more. So like, no one gives you, gives you turpentine. The price is increasing. And prices increase. That's right. And 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 well, prices increase in the United States, but that's that's different government involvement. Now in the United States prices <laughs> decrease because you have a better market system. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's better. I think you are healthier and happier because government is involved in a lot of areas of your life. You might not notice it, but the ceiling hasn't collapsed yet, so we're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to leave. Thank you. This better not be something I can't take on an airplane. <laughs>